Perfect. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining today. Today's agenda, we did send out uh, copies of the slides on Friday for everyone to review. And as we always do after today's meeting, if you have additional questions or feedback after today's presentation, please feel free to send those to us throughout the week. Um, so today we're going to cover why we're here, kind of the purpose of today's meeting. We're going to do a discussion on the guiding principles of the rate redesign. We're going to talk about a high-level overview of value-based purchasing and alternative payment methods for uh, rate specific for this project. And then we're going to do some of our open discussion where we have four questions at the end where we're going to ask you to provide your feedback that you'd like us to consider as part of the rate reform. So today, as you all know, we've been asked to reevaluate uh, the reimbursement model and rate methodologies for the NIFs and the RCFs. Uh, today's discussion will focus on rate impacts of value-based purchasing. So we're interested in your feedback on some potential options to consider as part of value-based purchasing, your feedback on an overall approach, um, and just items that you'd like us to consider and to um, think about as we go through implementing uh, the new rate reform and specific to value-based purchasing today. I am gonna turn it over to Michelle. I believe she's here to walk through the guiding principles. Absolutely, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Michelle Probert, main care director. Nice to see folks here today. And hopefully um, some of this has, uh, at this point is sounding familiar to you, but I, I do think it is, is helpful to um, uh, to be re repetitive in terms of what our guiding principles are uh, for this project. And so I will run through these um, once more. Uh, so our guiding principles for rate redesign, um, and, and these really apply uh, very broadly to main care, not to this project alone, but they to apply to this project as well. And there are three main ones. Uh, one is we want to make sure that rates are adequate to enable sustained access for our members to care. Uh, that is critical. Uh, we also want to make sure, again, across main care and specific to this project, that um, the way we pay for care provides incentive for high quality care, um, as well as for efficient care. And when you have a combination of looking at that cost efficiency as well as that quality, that is really what we talk about when we talk about value um, and high value care. And then thirdly, we are all collectively interested in having rates that decrease administrative burden, both for you all, for facilities, as well as for the department. Um, so to speak in a little bit more detail, especially with regards um, to the first principle around adequacy of rates, uh, there are a number of different components of that. Um, first, uh, Again, we want to make sure that we're covering reasonable costs. And I will say, if you're not aware that the Centers for Medicare and, and Medicaid Services do have a requirement that rates be reasonable and efficient. Um, and uh, part of making sure that we are able to cover reasonable costs is also looking, um, one, where there's cost variation that is meaningful and that we want the rate structure to address. Um, and then also where there's cost variation that um, may, may be unwarranted or maybe something that we could avoid in the future. And so we wanna look at both sides of the coin with our rate reform effort. Um, let's see, so we, uh, part of making sure that rates are adequate as we've talked about uh, before and all um, certainly uh, came to appreciate this even more during COVID is making sure that um, that the rates are enabling you all to achieve the, uh, the size of the workforce um, that you require to deliver high, high quality care um, and that you're able to hold on to that workforce. Um, and then uh, also an important component of making sure that rates are and continue to be adequate is to have a method uh, to make sure that those rates keep pace with changes in the cost of care delivery. Um, I will also say that we are very interested in making sure that um, our system uh, supports an appropriate mix of nursing facility and res care facilities, and that that mix is really driven um, by resident need. Um, we want facilities um, to 
be able to serve the members that they have and not feel like there's an incentive to change your facility type uh, because one payment model is more potentially beneficial um, than another. Uh, we wanna make sure that our payment models support um, our facilities and, and that the residents in those facilities are getting the care that they need. I think that that uh, covers our principles. So I will turn it back to you, Justin. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. All right. So today uh, is meeting number five on value-based purchasing. You see it's the uh, this first phase, the five that we've walked through, as you know, has been kind of an information gathering and looking for your feedback on things you'd like us to consider as part of the rate reform. Um, we will go through kind of next steps at the end of the presentation, but just to let you know, after today, we'll go away for a while and we'll be developing uh, the methodology and the rates. And then when we reconvene next time, we'll start to walk through uh, the methodology chosen, um, how your feedback was incorporated in the rates themselves. So we'll go through that at the end of the presentation. So what is value-based purchasing? What is an alternative payment model? So traditionally, reimbursement and quality have been disconnected, often referred to as the quality disconnect. Programs to promote quality are often limited, um, especially in the nurse facility setting, to provider rate systems that reflect the quality of care a facility delivers relative to their peers on a continuous scale. Um, this would be an example like the Medicare STARS program. Um, but value-based purchasing moves payment away from a focus strictly on cost reimbursement and the volume of care provided. It focuses on value as well, things like improved cost efficiency and quality and that's delivered through an alternative payment models, which we are working with uh, DHHS to explore. Um, the focus on APMs is to share accountability for cost and quality and support care that patients value and incentivizes outcomes that matter to them. And as of 2019, uh, roughly 50 states or 50% 50 of the states, I think it's 24 states with 30 different programs um, in nursing facility have some type of quality program tied to payment. Um, in 2020, there was also a state Medicaid director's letter um, that really pushed towards moving towards value-based purchasing uh, as part of rate design overall, not just a nurse facility. So I think that that has made it more prevalent in recent years, obviously with the pandemic, some of that has slowed down, but um, there's a lot of movement, especially in the long-term care settings towards uh, incorporating value-based purchasing. Uh, the quality component of uh, alternative payment model must incorporate a portion of reimbursement that is contingent on the quality performance. Um, the kind of steps to this that we'll look at is determine how a model will tie reimbursement to the quality performance. We'll select performance measures. Um, and again, there's also the Innovation and Quality Advisory Council that, uh, that's going on as well, which is helping to inform the performance measures. But um, we'll go through and determine performance measures. and. You know, if you look at other states, um, I think there's a variation in the programs that currently have this between one quality measure for the entire program. I think it's up to 37 um, in, in the largest states. So there is a balance between picking the appropriate number to make sure that you can properly manage and balance. And I think the average across the states is around eight performance measures. So we'll go through and, and determine those. We'll look at how to assess the performance and then also determine the methodology to adjust payment based on the performance outcomes. The elements of a good value-based purchasing program, you want a predictable uh, metric benchmark within the performance period that we're measuring. We want it to be transparent so everyone knows how they're being measured. We wanna use an understandable payment structure that's both um, efficient, but also though that folks know how they're being managed and how to improve. We wanna address, uh, relevant aspects to the nursing resident, residential facility care. Um, the measures that we're looking at need to impact um, the care of the patients. Um, otherwise, they, they may not have any impact at all. And you wanna ensure that the incentives are large enough to enable facilities uh, to invest in redesigning care and improving quality. And this is just a very rudimentary example, um, just to make sure everyone kind of understands um, Certainly is not any indication of which method we'll use, but um, as Michelle mentioned, mentioned earlier, DHHS has shared with other providers the goal or to hold providers accountable for provision of baseline quality while ensuring rates are adequate to enable this level of service provision and also to reward exceptional performance. 
So in this example here, you can just see kind of the, the mecha or mechanism of it. We'll develop an overall rate payment um, for the nurse facilities in this example. We'll develop a quality performance score. And then in this example, for instance, nurse facility one, if they're below the baseline of quality, they will get a rate that's some portion lower than the 100% of that rate payment. The baseline or average nurse facility would get the exact 100% rate payment. And the nurse facility that's operating, um, I did this backwards, sorry, above the baseline would get greater than and then below over here on the right would get a rate less than 100%. I apologize, I stated that backwards. So we will, uh, next step, we will uh, move to the questions, but I did wanna just make sure if anyone had any comments or questions uh, that you'd like to ask before we kind of get into the Q and A session that we typically do. All right, so I am gonna turn. One question, I guess, uh, are you gonna share some examples of other state programs that you know have been in effect for some time, how they've worked, um, you know, on this particular, on the value-based model approach? Or, I mean, have any of them been in place for a number of years so that you have data? On, on one of the slides, on one of the earlier slides, the Guidehouse team included a, a report citation, and that is a review of what several states have done. And I think you would find that report really helpful, Michael. Okay. And Michael, as part of the work that we're doing, kind of in developing the methodology, we are sharing, you know, what we've seen in other states, what's readily available in other states. Um, so I think that'll be determined what, what we share when we get to kind of roll in the process out. All right, I appreciate that. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Can I ask, uh, there's no mention states have performance and improvement. And this seems to isolate the performance, not the improvement. So like a underperforming center, less than 100%, though they improve, greater but still are under that 100% threshold would still get a reduction of their rate. Does it get modified? So I think this, uh, the first thing I do want to mention on the reduction of rate, um, keep in mind we are doing a, a new rate rebase that, you know, your rates from what they are now could be larger than what you're currently paying as part of this uh, redevelopment of the rate process. As far as the performance versus uh, improvement, I think that'll be part of the, um, the mechanics that we look at and how we want to implement this. Obviously, it's going to be a new initiative, a new program. So how we'll roll that out and kind of figure that in will kind of evolve and we'll, we'll look at that as part of the development of this, this program. Okay. And I would also say, Rick, that, I mean, this is one example. So um, I've absolutely, and I, I'm not speaking specifically to nursing facilities, but I've, I've seen other value-based models where uh, where there is a component that acknowledges um, improvement as well. So thanks for that comment. All right, I am gonna turn it over to Danielle. We're gonna uh, walk through similar to uh, how we've done in the past. We'll ask four questions and ask folks to include some comments in the chat, and then we will copy and paste them into here to ensure that they are captured. So, Justin, I'm sorry to interrupt. We do have one question in the chat. Um, can you see the chat or would you like me to read it? There it is. Yeah, yeah. I think I was typing when Michael was asking the question. I think you answered that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I do see that yeah, now. I didn't see it before. I was able to pull it up. So thank you. Yeah, thanks, Justin. So um, this is our our last Q and A session for a while now, as Justin noted. So I'm happy to kick this off. And I know we've already been having some good discussion around these value based purchasing um, so far. So again, so you'll answer the questions in the chat. And then we'll discuss, um, please raise your hand so we can call on folks 
and let's get started. So we have four questions today around the value-based purchasing. And question one is what's the most important to measure as a part of the program development? That is, what should the frequency of performance assessment and adjustment be? Number three is what specific features should we look for in implementing the value-based purchasing? And then just an open floor to close it out. So question one, as we consider the value-based purchasing development, what's the most important to measure as part of the quality program development? So we'll wait a moment as you can think about it, and then we'll start pasting from the chat. So we have quality measures already used by the five star program. I think that's a that's a very good point. We should, as other people mentioned, look at what's been working in other states and then see if that's feasible for Maine. Patient satisfaction is also a very good thing to measure. Um, you know, there's a lot of facets to patient satisfaction as well and, and ways that you can measure it. Got a lot Family satisfaction, that's a good point as well. It's not just the patient, but there's more stakeholders involved here. So can I ask, I know we have one comment that said use the five-star rating and another that said do not use the five-star rating. Just wondering if um, maybe you could elaborate on that. I, I'm not sure who has. Um, looks like Maureen said do not mm -hmm. use. I said don't use the five-star overall rating because that is spread amongst the, in the state. Um, it doesn't necessarily reflect, it just kind of breaks it out by uh, providers in the state. I think that you could use the uh, star rating for other measures, but I don't think that the overall five-star measure would really give us um, what we would want to see improvement. Perfect, thank you. You're saying, Maureen, you look at using components, but not the whole overall. Right, the overall uh, five-star rating, I don't think, um, it's not really gonna give us what we want. Thank you. Um, Angela has a good point. So she says some providers may need special considerations or exceptions. Um, and then I'm also seeing a couple different comments in here about the, the slow start from Angela, from Maureen. Do either of you want to? I assume oh, I when you mentioned uh, slow start, you're talking about like a phased in approach. Yes, that's um, I think is really important because I think if you look at how CMS has done it, and I don't think we need to go as slow as they have uh, with their value based purchasing, but I think that we also want to be careful that we don't have 30 measures going on that everyone's trying to understand and learn and um, adapt to. So both speed of implementation, but also complexity, you're saying, Maureen, with, start yes. with, with, with fewer rather than more, and then it'll add over time. Yeah, <clears throat> and start with ones that are, are maybe already um, being collected. I think that uh, to try to reinvent the wheel um, would be difficult for, for members. We have so much that is currently collected. It, I think it would be best if we could use something that we're already used to collecting and submitting. And Rick, thank you for your comment about um, 
introduced and stagnant needs to be periodically uh, modified. Certainly timing and um, changes over time is something that we will um, look at as part of this process. So thank you for that comment. And if I could jump in and ask Cheryl, uh, if you have a particular patient satisfaction tool that you have in mind, or that is commonly used in Maine? <clears throat> I think that would be kind of tricky. Um, there is the core Q uh, satisfaction ratings that sort of uh, standardizes across different tools. That might be something to think about. Great, thank you. I'm also curious if um, folks would have uh, different recommendations for nursing facilities versus rest care facilities, or if you think that they should be the same, or if there's different considerations um, for value-based purchasing for both. Can you say why yes different Maureen? Sure, sorry. Um, you know, if we start first of all, if we go back to the core Q, uh, what I like about core Q for satisfaction is that there is a core Q for assisted living or residential care. So I think that part is great. I think that uh, when we start looking at the uh, residential cares, it is gonna be a little more difficult Right now, if uh, a person is having case mix index reviews done, then there is uh, data that will tell us what some of the quality indicators or quality measures are at the state level. Um, they're not as, as well reported to everybody, but I think the good news is we have the data there um, and we need to work probably with Muskie and Supinet's team to really look at uh, the validation of those measures. Are boxes 13 and 16 duplicates? Mm -hmm. Looks like they might be, let me. Hey, 12 and 14 are as well. Yeah, it's copying and pasting more than one at a time. I'm not sure why. And I, I see Wanda's comment in here, and I think it does echo some of the stuff we've already talked about. So um, having data that shows the correlation between the metrics and the resident satisfaction. Does anyone else have any thoughts on this? I got all the comments now. I'll have one, I have one a follow-up question for Maureen because Maureen, I think you were talking about mm -hmm. um, the, the fact that measures of patient experience may just not be the same or not available or not as widely used between different facility types. Um, and I also hear your comment about um, data source for RCS is different, but um, uh, is let's assume for a moment that you could get a comparable um, uh, data and information from both facilities is is there would you be um would you be in favor of or against or neutral on using um the same metrics assuming you could have quality data available for both uh, across facilities do you see pros and cons to that um i i guess just speaking off the cuff i would tend to say that i would like that idea i think many of us know that our residents that are living in our residential cares could very easily be living in our nursing homes. Um, and, and so I think that there are a lot of similarities there. I think if we could get comparable data, that would be good. But I also think we need to think about um, what's different in residential care because they are different and we, we wanna think about how do we ensure that there's some difference. And I don't know the answer, so um, something to ruminate on. That's helpful, thank you. Guidehouse team, before we move on from this slide, can you please be sure to paste in Wanda Pelkey's comment? 
Uh, I think that's a really important one. Um, but we really should be posting, pasting in everything. I think Wanda's comment is already in box 15. Number 15. Oh, great. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, I think I got all of them now. I think I'm. Yep. All right. Well, let's go to question two. So this is about what the frequency should be for evaluation and payment. So how are they doing it now? Do you think it's working? How would you make it better? And just your general feedback on how often you think, um, how often you think the assessment should be done, and um, you know how often measures should be reviewed. The, all those different kind of things, payments. I, I think some of it comes to the question: Are the measures going to be individually paid for, or is it going to be an aggregate? Because we do have some states that can use outcome measures or CMS measures, and they're actually paying you on a different time schedule. For that, Virginia might be, pay, you know, paid uh, in like April for the CMS measures, then outcome measures, then other states, it's an aggregate score, and then you're a rate. So on an accurate score, it's going to be more annual, if you're following me, where it's, where it's periodic measures, they can pay it at different times during the year. And, and Rick, do you, as a, as a business, do you have a preference? I do not like the annual one. Because it can't be, you know, it can never be assumed that you're going to get the full balance. And to have the money spread over more as we spend makes more sense to me from a business perspective, as opposed to getting a lump sum check during the year. Thank you. Uh, regarding what Rick just said, am I to take it that? this additional payment for quality what rick was saying just once a year i i would think that if you're a facility that had poor results and that set your quality payment for an entire year that kind of goes against trying to improve uh, if you get things adjusted on a quarterly basis as you improve so does the money rather than having to wait an entire year before the, you see the fruits of your labor. Can I ask a clarifying question? Because I feel like we're talking about two different things here. Um, I guess I looked at that as how often would we change and make adjustments to those goals and measures? And that to me was the important um, part to keep as consistent for a period of time. I would say we should not make changes to the expected outcomes or to the measure um, within at, at a minimum of a year. I don't think that that doesn't mean that we shouldn't, we're already measuring all these things at least quarterly. Um, I think we could look at measuring it quarterly and whether that rate change would happen at, on a quarterly basis. Um, I don't know how that works for the department. I don't know how that works for main care for paying that. But I think we don't want to keep moving what the goalpost is and what the measures are that frequently. And, and that's kind of where my comments are coming from. Maureen, yes. I, I think some of the problem also is these measures, you're getting paid a year in a lag. And it's just like, and it's very difficult for the state and CMS to pay you currently on measures. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. So it, when it comes to how often should um, homes and, and, and centers be paid, um, I agree. I think quarterly would be great for that. 
but I think if the question is how often should we reassess the measure, uh, what are the expected outcomes and um, adjust or move measures, I think we need to give that at least a minimum of a year, if not a couple of years. And, and I really hate to see our yeah. providers chasing yeah. new goals all the time. Marina, that's a very valid point that you're making. There is a difference between the measures and when they're changed or reassessed versus the payment structure. And that's certainly something that we're exploring as part of this process. So very good point that those are two different things. And I think the intent with this slide was to get more at um, uh, with the measures that have been set, how often are we assessing performance and issuing those payments um, versus the bigger, like when do we decide to you know, change up the measures, which is also a good and valid question, but uh, I think intended to be separate from this one. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that clarification. And when you think about the reasons why you even have this value-based purchasing, you're really wanting to drive and incentivize improvement, right, towards top quality. And, and so in, in that spirit, I think that those that, let's just say you do it annually, meet or exceed those standards, you know, set it and forget it for the next year and let that provider enjoy the rewards of attaining that achievement. And then for the others that um, either want to get to that exceeding the goals or even getting to the standards, you know, let them have the opportunity through quarterly reporting thereafter to get there, right? Because you're, I agree with Phil, when you're doing it just once a year, <laughs> you know, you, you may feel a little defeated when you hit your annual measurement date and then you don't meet it and you think, oh God, now I got to wait another whole year before I can even be rewarded for any improvement that I do. So uh, so my answer was a little bit of a blend of the both. <clears throat> you know, let those that are rewarded through a higher value-based purchasing payment enjoy that for the next year while letting the others kind of catch up by doing it quarterly if they want to provide some more information on a quarterly basis. Um, I would also say that one of the things I don't like about some of the quality ratings, the federal quality rating standards, is it's done on a sliding scale. So you always have some winners, and by design, you always have losers. Well, you know, if you're trying to meet some minimum standards, then, you know, why not set it so that everybody can be at or above uh, standard um, so that as a state, we may have all superstars when you compare our data against national standards. But if you set uh, or design a program where there's always, you know, 20% at the top and 20% at the bottom and all the rest fall somewhere in the middle, um, then you're not, you know, really incentivizing the masses to really, um, you know, strive for the top from a national perspective. And so I think that that's an important design consideration. So um, one of the things that I kind of just put in the chat was the measure in the improvement, not just the best, uh, but maybe set up a graded payment so that people who are improving, it, it would continue to build that perform that you know improvement. Is that what? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, you know, and I'm gonna use staffing here as an, as an example with a five-star quality rating system. I mean, by by Maine having minimum staffing standards, most nursing facilities had three or, or four or five star staffing measures. Yet, and maybe this is a terrible example, I'm not sure because I'm not that detailed oriented in this area, but I think even in that measure, we were measured on a sliding scale so that not everybody could achieve four and five star staffing. You know, Even though when you compare it on a national basis, every single nursing facility in Maine was at the top of the heap. Um, and that's that's why I wanna make sure that the main system, um, you know, designs these plans thoughtfully so that you don't have unintended consequences where as a state, we may just be knocking it out of the park nationally, but by design, you know, a certain percentage of them have to be one or two star performers. You're asking, I think, Wanda, just to confirm, you're asking for a, an absolute value that, that you're going to be above or below as opposed to a bell curve. <clears throat> well said. Thank you.
All right. Thank you, everyone. This has been really good feedback. I think we can move on to the next question, Danielle. Sure. Yeah, really good conversation on that one. So for this third question, so what specific features should we look at in implementing the value-based purchasing? So to reiterate, I think our last conversation would be more incremental measurement. That's what I was hearing. Are we agreeing with that? Can I ask for clarification on when you say specific features, can you elaborate what you're, I mean, are you talking something, for example, that, uh, for example, right now, everything under main care uh, is, is cost-based in that you are forbidden from making a dollar of profit. Are you saying that a potential feature might be that you can actually make a profit if your quality is exceedingly high? Is that what you mean by a feature? Did you do you see Wanda's note, Phil? She yes, said I do. That is, and is that what you're sale. is that what you're getting at? Is that yes. if you earn a reward, you want to be able to keep it? Exactly. Exactly. I mean, profit's been a dirty word for 45 years. Uh, and then you wonder why nobody wants to get into business. There is such a thing as a double bottom line, good quality and good profits. Both are achievable simultaneous. I'll just uh, call out a couple examples that I think that others have already said that I think fit onto this slide. Um, uh, as I think Justin said, one is the idea of phasing in a value-based purchasing approach or payment approach. Um, and then another, um, another thing folks mentioned was the idea of uh, providing an incentive for improvement, not just um, uh, the performance against a benchmark specifically. The key word I'm seeing here is that of implementing features we should look at in implementing, in the implementation. I mean, I think we've discussed before, don't do, don't do everything all at once, uh, piecemeal it in so that providers can manage the change as it occurs. And I, I'm not sure exactly how to write this, so I'll, I'll try to say it. But um, one thing I would say is try to make it so that you don't disincentivize providers um, from accepting residents. And what I mean by that is I think of right now some of our case mix in our facilities. We may have a really high case mix in one of our facilities and a lower one in the others. And when you talk about quality, you know, the other facility may have more falls because they have a higher aging population or other factors. And they really shouldn't be penalized for that. Because again, you know, the other facility just may have admitted, you know, less of a critical need or care for some of their residents and you know i i would hate to see people starting to screen to you know admit based on the types of things again i think of falls you know is 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 a good measure that everybody should try to improve on but if you know somebody's falling and that's something that would not entitle you to the incentive a provider could be disincented to admit that person. And I think along with that, I, I did put in the chat, but um, looking at uh, providers who take a higher number of certain types of residents, such as you know people with traumatic brain injuries or people with substance abuse disorders or people with um, you know, high uh, severe dementia, some of their quality measures could make them look like they're 
not doing so well, but part of it is because of the population that they serve or someone that has a specialized wound care program. They're probably gonna see more wounds um, than somewhere else. So just things to think about. And I think what just has been talked about these last two comments is really gonna be a challenge for, because your patient population is key to almost everything as it relates to how you operate, the results you have, in some cases, even how families, you know, view their loved one's care. Um, th this one's going to be really complicated to sort out when you do these kinds of measures, in my view. I agree. I guess the one thing that I hold on to is that there are so many other states who have done this that I'm sure we can learn um, how they've done some of that. I, I would encourage us to do that in this process, not try to reinvent the wheel if it's partially been invented already. Absolutely. I, but I don't think we should exclude anybody. I think, you know, maybe somebody has a bad survey. Um, I don't think there should be kind of a, use the word gatekeeper. I don't know, there's probably a better word for that, but something that excludes you from participating in this. The one thing we haven't talked about and the implementation of the value-based program, as we're dealing with zero sum Medicaid payments, the program should be built annually on new state funds so that when it's initially implemented, it is a minimal draw on the provider rates as they are at the time of initial implementation. The metrics take a quarter, six months, a year to develop. So the payment for the value-based program where the state says it starts at a date really doesn't kick in for about a year, six months, a year, depending on everything. And I think these programs have a tendency to work best when they're brought in slowly, added with new money, and the state is seeing the favorable results they want to see. And it's not really drastically taking away from provider payments that aren't qualifying for the measure. All right, any other comments or question? Oh, here's one. Oh. Any other thoughts here? I, I just want to go, I think um, Wanda said it very well there, and it makes me a little bit nervous when I look at the slide that you put up uh, that talked about here's the rate. And if you were meeting, you'd get 100% of the rate. If you were exceeding, you would get something above 100%. And if you were um, not meeting or somewhere, you would be less than that 100%. I think that that speaks exactly to what Wanda is saying. Are we going to be um, having people not have the reasonable rates that they need? Yeah, that's a good point. All right, so for 
our last portion here, is there anything else that's been in your head that we haven't talked about yet? This is our, our open dialogue section. So whatever we haven't discussed yet that you need to talk about. And uh, just add to this today's value-based purchasing, but also since this is kind of the last um, feedback gathering session, um, if there's anything kind of you want us to take away as part of the whole process, um, feel free to add that here as well. But for this phase, Justin, right? I just want to add that. I know yeah, you yeah. said it earlier. It's the last <laughs> session for this phase. We'll be back to talk with you guys more later. Yep, and we will cover that on the on the next slide. Yeah. I did just want to follow up um, in, in uh, response to the last comment that um, a way that people often talk about this is um, thinking about upside and downside risk, or if, if you can only uh, if you can only gain through quality, then that often can be called like upside only, right? And um, nationally, there is a push towards uh, two sided accountability, and so the idea that uh, there is a minimum quality and that there should be shared accountability so that as a provider, if you're not meeting minimum standards, then there is some financial risk for you. And that is the idea um, of the withhold. And I, I don't expect everyone to be on the same page with that, but I just wanted to talk about it um, in those terms as well. There's a lot of literature out there on the topic. Yeah, thanks for adding that, Michelle. I think the point that I would make is that I think it depends on where you start, right? If you're if your starting point to be the baseline for rates is 100% of allowable cost, let's just say that a provider needs reimbursement to cover those allowable costs to continue doing what they're doing, and if they're doing a lousy job, then taking away from that doesn't improve the situation, right? So I would agree with you that I think the industry could manage through takeaways or being provided more if the starting point was higher than something that just covers the bare minimum allowable costs, because then you would have the flexibility to say, I mean, if you want to equate it to profits, you can equate it to profits, but that a little bit of extra margin there would enable a facility to say, well, all right, I want, you know, the higher payment for sure. Um, and if I don't stretch for that, I'm going to have to endure something where my margins are, are less to the point of, you know, maybe just equaling allowable costs. But I think to expect a facility to survive with less than what's needed to cover allowable costs would not be a well-designed system to promote quality. Yeah, and that, that is a good point. I will uh, just kind of reiterate, um, we are doing the full rebase, so there'll be you know updated cost report based data. Will there be new trend and in inflation factors, risk adjustment? So this is just one component of an overall rebase, um, but certainly that is part of the consideration. Stu, did you have your hand up? You're on mute. Okay, yes, I do have my hand up, thank you. Um, I, I hope I'm not out of line here, but I wanted to take a step back to the last meeting where we talked about MDS, the feedback survey that um, Maine Healthcare sent out to the various facilities. There was information gathered from this group during the last feedback session, and then an additional questionnaire was sent out to other facility members. Um, was there any opportunity to discuss some of the comments that were received back from uh, the main healthcare survey that was sent out? Are you talking about Angela's response that she sent? Yes. Um, I, I have something here that, that came from Peter, and it says the MDS feedback survey, results of the survey. And these had to do with the pros and cons of your experiences with rugs and MDS. Yep. 
And that was just additional feedback from that Angela provided after the last meeting. And I think the goal would be to post that and make sure that everyone has access to that. Paul, do you want to speak to Angela's um, question in the chat about how the Quality and Innovation Council's work will dovetail with these rate reform efforts and feedback? Yeah, yeah sure. So, um, you know, at the Quality Council last time, last meeting, we had a we had a really robust conversation about um, what matters to residents and what kinds of measures you can look at uh, uh, to get at what matters to residents. Um, and that was complemented today, for example, by the discussion about the core queue and, and so on. So um, we will, we're gonna continue discussion in the Quality Council um, on other quality measures, and that will also be used to inform what measures um, the department will use um, to put together a, a value-based uh, uh, payment program. So they're complementary. And there's a little bit of, I'm glad Maureen that you're here today because you you also sit on that other council. So there's a, a, a bit of back and forth, uh, but also we'd be happy to provide all of you in, in this work group with the notes from the council meeting because it was, it was a great dis discussion. I think the other place where the council will continue to go, like after, you know, after we've settled on uh, a payment model with you all, I think there'll be ongoing discussions about how to improve quality. So one thing we didn't discuss today, for example, is if we were interested in supporting um, quality efforts, what would be helpful? Uh, would you find it helpful for us to provide a, a, a collaborative, a provider collaborative to talk about quality issues? Would you find it uh, helpful to have uh, technical assistance uh, you know, somebody coming and looking over your performance measures with you. Um, so those kinds of things I see evolving in the council as well. But in the short term, our biggest priority is to um, is to identify a, a reasonable number of metrics that could be incorporated into the payment rate model. All right, any last comments before we go through next steps and wrap up? I think we have about five minutes left on, on the clock. All right, going once, going twice. Again, certainly after today's meeting, if, if you have additional thoughts or want to provide some additional feedback, um, certainly do that. Um, so next steps, we wanna thank you all for your valuable feedback for our five work group meetings. I think there's been great interaction and great feedback provided for us to, to think through as part of all five of these meetings. Um, and we will, uh, we have gathered and are thinking through your feedback as part of our rate development process. This work group will reconvene in the fall. Uh, of course, we'll give advance notice before any, any meeting is set up to make sure everyone has time to prepare for that. Um, and the rate model will be presented at those meetings. And for further feedback as part of the main care rate system process under public law 2021 chapter 639. And then after that presentation in the fall, uh, there will be a, uh, the presentation will go through the rate methodology chosen and the developed rates. And then there will be a comment period, to submit questions and provide feedback after that meeting. Again, if you do have additional questions or comments you'd like us to consider, um, please feel free to reach out to Peter or myself. Our email is uh, in the slides. And then the last slide is just the contacts from the Guidehouse team. Any final questions, comments that anyone would like to make? All right, well, thank you so much again for joining today and for joining all five of these meetings. We appreciate your feedback. And we look forward to seeing everyone again uh, in the fall or later this summer in the fall. Try to keep it as simple as possible. Noted. <laughs> Thank you much. Thank you, Thanks, Justin. Everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.